welcome to the Fish Nerds, a show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd of the podcast, Licensed Fishing Guide, and friend to all nerds. We are so happy that you're listening. Sorry we've been gone for a few weeks. Uh, life sometimes gets in the way of podcasting. As many of you know, podcasting is not a uh, game of making tons of money. We don't make a living doing this. We do this because we love talking about fish, fishing, and eating fish. But anyway, welcome back today on the podcast. We are back and back with a vengeance and a little off our schedule. We're going to update you on the business of running a guide service. I'm going to tell you how the Fish Nerds guide service is going. We've got a phone call. That's right. Someone called our Fish Nerds hotline, 607-378-FISH, and shared their New Year's fishy resolutions with us. Doc Martin, our uh, fish doctor from Kansas, took her kids, her kids, her grown-up students uh, on a trip to the Bahamas. She shares that experience, and I spent some time at the Rockingham Fishing and Hunting Expo in beautiful downtown Manchester, New Hampshire, and I'm going to share some thoughts on that. Uh, and Hugo Medeiros, our fish nerds culinary correspondent, can't get enough tinned fish, and he's back with a recipe for us. Uh, so, a lot to talk about today. We're glad you're here, uh, and we're super glad. This is actually really important. We are super glad to welcome a, a new sponsor, uh, and, and sponsorship of the podcast is really important to us because um, I've been 184 episodes of the Fish Nerds podcast, and we don't really make money. We don't put any money in the bank on this show. We barely cover our expenses. So having sponsors makes a big difference. If you as listeners uh, like what we're doing and you're not already giving us money through other ways, um, simply going to our sponsors' websites and using our coupon code and checking things out makes a huge difference. I um, will tell you all about that. Uh, but we're really excited to welcome uh, our sponsor, Health IQ. Uh, and they called me and we talked on the phone and they were a good fit for this podcast. Health IQ uses science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance for health conscious people like runners, cyclists, strength trainers, vegans, and much, much more. You know, as a, as a fisher person, you might qualify for this. Some of, some fishers are really fit and really strong and really uh, in shape and live a healthy lifestyle. And they could save, um, you know, up to 33% on their life insurance. Uh, like saving money on your car insurance. Like if you're a good driver, you save money on your car insurance. You also, if you live a good lifestyle, you could save money on your life insurance. Uh, Health IQ will save you money on your insurance for living a healthy, conscious life. To see if you qualify and get a quote today, head to healthiq.com forward slash FN, Fish Nerds, FP, Fishing Podcast. Healthiq.com slash FN, FP. I should say, too, it's 4 o'clock in the morning when I'm recording this, so bear with my morning voice as we get rocking here. Uh, here's a quick update from the Fish Nerds Guide Service. Now, I've been guiding. This is my second winter as a fishing guide. Last year was great. This year, the weather's been insane. We went over Christmas break. We had days of negative 27 degrees, and then right after Christmas, temperatures went up, and we had pouring down rainy weekends uh, it's been crazy. The, the fish has been, the, the fishing has been okay, but the, uh, the ice quality has been all over the place. We had to, last week I had a crew on these older guys from Boston and, uh, to get them on the ice, I had to build a bridge, uh, a plank bridge to get on the ice. And it was the first time I ever gave clients ice picks uh, around their neck and thought they might actually need them. I don't usually, um, I don't usually think anyone's ever going to fall through the ice. The most dangerous thing probably about ice fishing is falling down on the hard ice itself. So I was really nervous getting these guys on. They did a great job. Uh, we caught a bunch of fish. Um, and the, one of the, I'll tell you two quick funny stories. One of the funny stories, I had these guys from, um, these chefs from Rhode Island come up, and they paid me for a yellow perch fishing trip. And that was their plan. They'd catch a whole pile of yellow perch, go back to Rhode Island, cook up a giant meal, and they're super happy. And... We couldn't catch a perch for anything. The easiest fish to catch, we couldn't catch. Instead, it was bass after bass after bass. Those pesky largemouth bass kept grabbing our tiny perch jigs, and they just wouldn't stop. Uh, they, that turned out to be a really, really great day. I then took out this group of teenagers, and one of them caught a bass that was probably pushing five pounds, a real bruiser. And before we got on the ice, I give, I give a safety talk, and I, you know, especially when I'm dealing with teenagers. And I tell them, if you don't do what you're told... When you're told to do it, you will die today. I really like to kind of drive this idea of, uh, 
you need to listen to the captain kind of tone. And so he got this bass. We took a bunch of pictures. And he's standing there holding it, you know, in, in two hands up about his waist level. And I say, okay, now let it go. And he literally just let go of the fish. And it flopped, slapped down on the ice. Um, so what I've learned is don't be so um, – is actually be very specific with teenagers on what you want them to do. It's because like, some of them can be very literal. Uh, but we, the fish seemed to recover okay. We took our time releasing it, made sure it was swimming before we let it go. Uh, and then this weekend I took out – boy, we had a great time on, on the worst lake in the state, Silver Lake. We went out catching lots of lake trout uh, and had a good time. So the guide service is going well. I'm booked up most weekends. I do have some free dates if people want to go fishing with the nerds. Just uh, give me a call or email or whatever. Just go to clay at fishnerds.com. Send me an email and we can set up a trip and it'll be totally fun. Uh, and the weather's getting better. So hopefully hopefully we will we will start catching more fish and uh, getting into some uh, some some nice ice for the rest of the winter. Now, we still have six weeks left of ice fishing season. So come give me your money. <laughs> All right. Now we got a phone call. From our friend, the crappy hippie. He's been really enjoying the show lately, and he participates in all of our things. I put out a call of action, uh, I think, two, three weeks ago, saying if you've got a fishy resolution, call the Fish Nerds hotline, 607-378-FISH. You can still do that if you want to. Leave a voicemail. I will use it on the show. Crappy hippie uh, has called, and here is he. Hello, Fish Nerd Nation. This is Crappy Hippie. You're a tree-hugging redneck from eastern Kansas, and I've got my New Year's resolution ready. My New Year's resolution simply is this, to spend more time with my fish nerds Midwest. Jeff Donaldson up in Kansas City, Missouri, that's about 45 minutes to the northeast of me. And if they can put up with my lackadaisical hygiene, then I think we could all get together and have a wonderful time, because, hell, I got a guitar, I got a kayak, I got a poor man's 10 car a rod. Uh, I call it a cane pole. But uh, that's one part of my resolution. Then I plan on going to visit my little girl in Massachusetts later in the summer. And while I'm visiting my daughter, I think I'm going to make a side trip on up to New Hampshire and meet Mr. Groves and hopefully Richard and Vinny too. So fair warning, everybody. I'm meeting my fish nerd friends this summer, this next year in 2018. That's my New Year's resolution. This has been Crappy Hippie, your tree-hugging redneck from eastern Kansas saying tight lines and valentines. Peace out. All right. Thanks, Crappy Hippie. Uh, we're glad that you're you're motivated to do some great stuff, and we look forward to hopefully fishing with you. That sounds really great. All right. Hey, let's check in with Doc Martin. Doc Martin is a professor, college professor, and she's one of, um, I think, I think one of the best things about this show, I I just love Doc Martin. Uh, and she took her students to the Bahamas. I'm going to let her and her kids tell you all about it. Fishners, it's Doc Martin. As many of you know, based on my Facebook page, I have been in the Bahamas since just after Christmas. I'm staying at the Drace Research Center with a bunch of students from my university, and I thought it would be fun to give you guys a little bit of a taste of what we're doing down here. So uh, the first person I would like to introduce you to is Troy, and he is the man in charge down here. So if we ever have any problems, he's the guy that we go to. And I thought I would let him tell you a little bit about the station and who he is. So without further ado. Hello, everyone out there. Um, my name is Troy Dexter. I'm the executive director here at the Gerace Research Center. Um, so this is my first podcast ever. Um, <laughs> I'll try not to mess up. The Gerace Research Center has been around for over 45 years. Uh, it was first run as a consortium of colleges in, the, in 1971. It's been running ever since, and it's a place for colleges and universities and some high school groups to bring students to learn about marine biology, geology, archaeology, uh, botany, and a whole host of other things. 
We provide accommodations and lab space and teaching rooms and food and vehicles to get out into the uh, into the field sites around the island. Uh, we are located on San Salvador, which is one of the family islands. So it's um, kind of on the far northeastern section of the Bahamas. Um, this island is special in that it is cut off um, from the Bahamas Carbonate Bank. It is an isolated platform, so we are surrounded by deep water. In fact, you can swim out to the the wall, the deep water edge, uh, from certain parts of the island. Uh, it makes for great sports fishing. We have a number of people, uh, tourists, who come here um, to do deep sea fishing. All right, so how about we talk about some of your personal favorite bays or features on the island? I know there's some cool history and some old ruins that are around. You want to talk about that a little bit? The number one spot, I'd say, on San Salvador is Grotto Beach. Um, this is on the southeastern section of the island. It's usually pretty calm, although in the wintertime, depending on the direction of the wind, it can get a little bit rough, as uh, one of the groups saw today. Uh, generally a calm, nice place with a um, pavilion to have uh, lunches. It's it's the, the usually the favorite spot for people to go. But we have a number of other locations around the island. There's a very large uh, bay called Fernandez Bay. And there's a number of patch reefs there. Uh, so you can snorkel and see a number of fish and some of the coral reefs. All right. So thank you for that overview of San Salvador and the Juris Research Center. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Maybe something super fun fact that you have in your back pocket for us or any last words before you sign off? The Juris Research Center itself was originally a Navy base. It was built in the mid-50s and continued operation into the late 60s. So our buildings are a bit old, but they are well built. Our station functions as the hurricane shelter for the north section of the island. All of our water is produced by a massive rainwater catchment in the back. So we are at least self-sufficient as far as water is concerned. And we are slowly switching over to solar power so we can be self-sustaining without running off the island electrical grid. All right. Thanks so much, Troy. That was wonderful. And he's taken very good care of us out here. And I have a couple other folks that I'll be interviewing. So hopefully this will be a nice little segment. And I personally have enjoyed my time on the Bahamas. So you get to hear from a couple other faculty and some students. And with that. Hey, Fish Nerds, it's Doc Martin again. I am here with Dr. Dave McKenzie, the professor in charge of the class from our university. And he is going to talk a little bit about what we are doing down here in the Bahamas and why we are here and all the cool stuff we have done. So without further ado, here is Dave. All right. Hello, my name is David McKenzie, and we are here as a class from Emporia State University to basically... um, look at all these places that most people from Kansas have never seen before. Uh, So it's a tropical field biology class. Um, We do focus mostly on snorkeling, but we try to explore a lot of different things. We look at the plants. We look at a few of the animals. Um, Tomorrow we're going down into a cave where we're mostly going to be looking at geology. Um, We spend a bunch of time on some different beaches, uh, places like French Bay, um, but that, that are just absolutely beautiful places to visit. Um, spent a lot of time in the water. We're doing a night dive or we did the night dive last night. Um, we just do a lot of different things. And the goal is to just explore the, the, as much of the island as we can within 10 days and to get the students here to really explore the tropical environment on their own with my assistance and um, just learn whatever we can in the short time that we have. So, how long have you been teaching this class, Dave? Well, this is actually my very first time. I came down here two years ago with Dr. Dwight Moore. He had been teaching this class for, I believe it's 30 years. He's been down here, I believe it's 14 different times. And that was so that I could see how he did it. And now I'm taking over. So, this is my first time teaching this class. (laughs) 
So what exactly are the students' responsibilities when they're down here? What are their duties every day, and what's the overall course goal? Well, the overall course goal is to really do as much as much exploration as you possibly can. So the duties are to ask questions and to make observations. That's really the number one job that the students have, is to learn by being totally immersed within the environment. And when you're totally immersed, you can't help but see things and to have questions about those things. And um, it, it seems to be a really popular class because students very often have smiles on their faces, even when they're in pain or frustrated or being bitten by thousands of mosquitoes. There's still a lot of happiness, and they're often surprised at how much they walk away from with this class. And do you have anything that you think is the your most favorite thing that you've done so far? I know we still have what a day left. So what do you think has been the coolest thing that you've seen? So um, also maybe what do you do for research? Because these are the fish nerds that we're talking to, and uh, you you are kind of a fish nerd, but your research doesn't focus around fishes. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I'm actually a plant ecologist by training. Um, I've always been fascinated by marine biology. When I was little, I wanted to be a marine biologist until I realized that you don't usually get to play with the big pretty fish as a marine biologist. There's more chemistry and more physics than, and more microbiology than actually playing with fish. So I went to another love, which is plant ecology. And um, I have one graduate student who is looking at uh, the effects of cattle trails on the plant community in a place called the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in Kansas. And then I have another graduate student who is looking at the effects of climate and weather variability on uh, plant cell structure and uh, woody plant establishment within prairies. So that's actually my area of research is plant and fire ecology. Um, but my love of fish has made it so that this is a really good class for me because it's not super in-depth to where I need to know every little tiny nuance, but I do know enough to show the students around and to introduce them to a lot of really interesting things. And the coolest thing you've seen or done so far? Oh, <laughs> that's a hard one. Um, I think just seeing the diversity of fish, that's got to be my favorite thing. Um, I've I've seen a lot different species this time. Um, this only be my second time on the island. I haven't yet figured out what patterns I'm noticing, but I've definitely noticed some patterns, and I've seen a lot of species this time that I didn't see last time. And conversely, I did not see a lot of species this time that we did see last time. Um, so, I yeah, for me, really, it's just the snorkeling. That's absolutely my favorite. Um, and if we could stay another couple weeks, that'd be fantastic. All right. And do you have any words of wisdom or any last minute things you would like to tell the fish nerd nation out there listening? Well, that's an on the spot question. <laughs> She's laughing over here. Um, I would say keep exploring, always ask questions, keep looking around you. There's always something new to see. It doesn't matter if you've been here 30 times like Dr. Moore, not 30 times, for 30 years like Dr. Moore. He always had um, something new to see when he came to this island. And I think a lot of us can really take a lesson from that, that it doesn't matter how many times you've been somewhere, just keep looking around and there's always going to be something new to see and something new to learn. Hi guys, my name is Janelle DePriest. I am a senior. Um, I am actually a biology major with a concentration in pre-medicine. However, I am interested in other fields of biology, hence why I'm here down at the Jerez Research Center in the Bahamas. I will say that it is uh, negative degrees in Emporia while we've been down here, so that hasn't been too bad as well. By far, my favorite part of the trip has been for one, watching the sea turtles, because we never get to see that kind of stuff in Kansas. Um, but mostly just being able to see all of these tropical fish and just how they interact with their environment, especially considering how much trash and human debris has actually been incorporated into the reefs and now. Um, it's just amazing to see what kind of things that we take for granted that we're seeing these fish swim around in. They're making, they're making it their home. The reefs have reclaimed it. Um, it's interesting and it's sad at the same time. 
it really makes you reconsider what you're using uh, at your houses and how you could use that better or if you could even eliminate it from your use entirely. Um, so this this trip has definitely been educational in that aspect, as well as just a really fun trip to see things that I normally don't get to see in Kansas, where it's very landlocked and very cold. <laughs> um, but that's all I have for you. Derek Reese, and I'm a sophomore biochemistry and molecular biology major, pre-med student. Um, this trip has been incredible. I was very apprehensive at first because of the high price tag, but it has been worth every penny. I got to spend a day in South Beach, Miami, enjoying the beach, shops, and food. The coolest thing I've seen in San Salvador was three dolphins, green sea turtles, and a parrotfish. I think the blue chromis is the most beautiful fish, but the tiger fish is really cool. Hello, I'm Autumn Howell. I'm from Emporia State. I'm majoring in microbiology. Uh, this trip has just been a really amazing experience. I've been to 24 countries, and I have to say that this trip has been the most eye-opening and just all-over amazing trip I've ever taken. Uh, my favorite fish is the blue-headed wrasse, and that's because it can change genders. When the male leaves or something happens to the male, the female can't like the lead female or the most dominant female completely changes genders and I just think that that's really incredible so I was really stoked to see that and they're all over here in the Bahamas and we've seen so many other animals like octopus stingrays uh, I held a puffer fish yesterday which was pretty amazing we saw a couple of sharks, and the coolest part of this trip was swimming out to the wall and seeing this drop from 75 feet to over 6,000 feet. And that was just crazy incredible. I also swam down and touched the bottom of the wall. So I think that's a pretty cool feat, too. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jenica Wheeler, and I am with Emporia State University. I am a senior this year and graduate in May. I am currently on the trip to the Bahamas with the field ecology group, and so far we have encountered a lot of cool fish. My favorite one so far is the parrotfish, and I've seen some stingrays and some you know, dolphins, sea turtles. It's been an amazing experience, and I'm really happy that I'm here. And then I've learned so much about fish that it's just overwhelming but it's also the best experience I've ever had. Hi my name is Ashley Wheeler and I'm, and I'm a biology major and I heard about this trip through one of my teachers and I was so psyched to hear that it's in the Bahamas so I decided to go and I'd have to say this has been the most educational experience and you I mean you just really get to get out in the field and learn about the fish and actually visually see them and I think that's something that it can't be replaced so um Everything from swimming with dolphins to tur sea turtles, that's been amazing. So, um, yeah, that's about it. Hi, I'm Kate Sheck, and I am one of Dr. Martin's advisees, and I am on the Bahamas trip with Emporia State University. And while here, being a small-town girl from Kansas, a very landlocked state, I have never really had the opportunity to see the ocean or actually be in the ocean. So I think my favorite part of this entire trip is just seeing all of the new things that I didn't even know existed until a week ago. And one thing I didn't know exist was dolphins, and it was just amazing to be able to not only see, but swim with wild dolphins while being here. And it's just been an amazing learning experience and a fantastic journey. Thank you, Doc. Uh, hey, speaking of support, and Doc Martin's been a big supporter of the show, uh, if, if you want to support the show uh, financially and we can use your money, go to patreon.com forward slash fish nerds and help us crowdfund the show. Right now, we make a little bit of money um, through that process. I'd like to find a way to make a living podcasting, so selling ads, having 
having uh, listeners give us, you know, a dollar an episode could get us there. In fact, if every listener gives us a dollar an episode, I could quit my other jobs and just podcast full time. That would allow me to do research, travel, buy better equipment. Uh, I'd love to pay my correspondents, people like Doc Martin, who contribute such great stuff to the show. I'd love to be able to, to, to pay them uh, for what they're doing. I, I do try to buy them equipment and help them out, but I'd It'd be so great to pay them. Patreon.com is how you can pay them. If you like what Doc Martin did, go to Patreon.com. Give us a dollar an episode. Four dollars a month uh, will get you there. There's all kinds of rewards there. Two dollars, you get a hoorah. Get five dollars, you get a hat. But more importantly, you support in this show. We do have one patron giving us $25 an episode. That's um, Josh Lopes from LopesTax.com. LopesTax.com. If you are in New England and need help with your taxes or accounting, go to LopesTax.com and they will help you out. Uh, so anyway, patreon.com slash fish nerds. Help us pay for this show. Thank you. How about some Stump the Fish Nerds? Stump the Fish Nerds is a segment where usually we get a phone call from a uh, listener, 607-378-FISH. That, that's how it should go because voicemails work better on the on audio podcast. Uh, and leave us a question, and we try to find you, the listeners, the answer. And uh, I love this segment. Uh, so give us a call if you ever want to be part of it. We got a message on Facebook, which also works, but I, I'm not, I can't promise I'll use them all the time. Uh, Josh Pruitt called a uh, 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 message us on Facebook, and he said, "Hey Clay, I got a couple of doc demons last week, uh, and there was a gentleman uh, who asked if I was going ice fishing. So my stump the fish nerd question is: Have you ever used a doc demon ice fishing? And to I had to Google doc demon, and all doc demon is is a uh, a short fishing rod. Um, I think all it is is an ice fishing rod sold in the south." They just sell them down there because that way they can sell them all over the place. And they're made for fishing on docks. And the answer to the question is, yes, we have, and they work just fine. Fish don't care what you're holding in your hands. So all you all you custom rod people and fancy pants fishing rod people and uh, expensive tenkara people and fly rod people, the fish don't know what kind of rod you're holding. They know technique. They know lure. They know all these other things, but they don't care what you're holding. Um so that's up to you what kind what brands you use. I never cared that much. Uh, but yeah, I have used them, and they work just fine. So that's uh, from Josh. We also got a message from our fly fishing correspondent, from Rich Collins. He said, uh, why does it seem like one scallop in every batch is darker yellow than the rest? Anyone ever notice that? Some nice ivory colored, and then there's a Purdue chicken yellow one. And his theory, which his theory is it, they may have had row. So they may be their preggers. Uh, and then uh, we got some Facebook messages on this one. Stephanie Russell, one of our friends from New Hampshire, says, It's people! It's made of people! So Soylent Scallops is the game. Lori Zimmerman Papadic says, Like clams, they were eating something different at the time. Clams are the same way. Captain Sean Says female scallops turn orange when ready to spawn. Um, and uh, Lori then agrees with her. Sean also says we usually pull the orange ones out to sell in the Chinese market um, because they like the nice different colored stuff. Uh, and I think that's right. I, I bet I, I usually, Captain Sean knows a lot about the world of the ocean. I think he's right. The other thing I would, only thing I would change is I would say there's also individual variation. Just like uh, people and animals have different tones of skin color and all that stuff. I, I think with scallops, it could be the same thing. Uh, that's just variation. It's no big deal. It doesn't change the flavor. Uh, now, David Perry from Wicked Fisher, he said, my clams in my aquariums would get off color before they spawned. Uh, the Maximus croceus would turn from deep blues to green. Uh, and that is when I knew to turn off my canister filter because they would make a foggy mess. So uh, it seems to be a spawning thing. We also got a, another Stump the Fish Nerds from Anthony Von Dresser. Dresser, I can't even say it. Uh, Anthony is the host of the Spawn, uh, Spawn, <laughs> of the the Curse of Silver Lake podcast. He's co-hosted the show a few weeks ago. A friend of mine, uh, and his question is, what is the best tasting freshwater fish? And he put it up on Facebook. There was tons of questions. But I've got a book. I've got the, the Tinned Fish Gourmet book, uh, and I want to give it away. And so what I'm going to do instead of 
answering this question. I, and we all have our favorites, and you can't really stump anybody with with the favorites because that's an opinion. Uh, instead of um, giving you my opinion on what's the best Haitian freshwater fish, I'm going to invite you to call in 607-378-FISH. Leave us a voicemail of what you think the best tasting freshwater fish is. Do it by February 10th. I will randomize all the answers. And the winner will get the Tin Fish Gourmet uh, cookbook that we just can't stop talking about here on the podcast. Uh, and I also will throw in a Fish Nerds hat or beanie, depending on where you live. You might live in Miami and not need a beanie, beanie. but you might be in Ontario and you need a beanie. So uh, anyway, call 607-378-FISH and you say, hi, my name is Clay from New Hampshire. My favorite freshwater fish is dot, dot, dot. And here's how I cook it, uh, and here's how you can contact me. And then we will uh, use that on the show, and you can win a book or and a beanie. So. Hey, folks, Hugo Maderos here, fishing correspondent for the Fish Nerds here during the holiday season. We just had a um, the, the Christmas celebration, a uh, really good time. And now, as you can hear, I am doing uh, a little meal for us. This one's going to be really quick, really simple, but a um, really nice one. So one of the gifts that I got for uh, Christmas was um, dried oregano from uh, my godchild's uh, garden that she had at, uh, from, from her own garden at home. So what I am going to do with this, continuing on the theme of um, the book that we had of the Tin Fish Gourmet... I'm getting into this stuff, so I'm, I picked up some uh, squid in a tin in its own ink. So now, during the season and the um, during uh, the spring and uh, fall, we go out and catch squid, and um, love doing that. But well, it's out of season uh, as far as I know right now. So I was lucky to find squid in its own ink in a tin. Now, all I did, very simple is uh, sauteed some uh, fresh garlic in some uh, really good olive oil. Now, the trick with good olive oil is you can't really uh, heat it up too much. Uh, ruins the flavor of it. So I kept it on medium heat, added that uh, the garlic, and then I took, which is pretty cool, I took a zucchini and put it through this machine called a vegetini, which makes it into, looks like spaghetti. So it's pretty cool. It's a lot of fun to do. So we got spaghetti made out of zucchini, basically. Sautéing that with that wonderful oregano in that awesome uh, olive oil. This olive oil is imported uh, locally here at a local shop uh, directly from Greece, from somebody's grandparents on their, um, from their olive uh, farm in, uh, in Greece. And it's, it's wonderful. Really, really super tasty. So I'm basically going to do that and now just put the squid in it just to heat them up. I am still debating if I'm going to do tomato sauce or just the squid ink. I'll probably do a tomato sauce. I get a really nice quality uh, tomato sauce here made by a company called Tuscan Traditions. And you guys, I know I have no problem with good quality um, jarred uh, tomato sauce. The people that make these... Um, you know, work really hard at making an excellent product and having their product put up on the shelves by a company that sponsors them. So they do take um, the time and effort to make a really good product. Some of them, the good ones anyways. Okay, so I think that's it. We are going to put this beautiful squid in this black ink. You got to be careful with this stuff. It gets everywhere. If it gets on you, I mean, it stays like crazy. Right there goes the squid. Looks good. So black, it's so funny. It's kind of cool to cook with this stuff. When I catch um, squid in season, when I catch them myself, I will, and a lot of people think this is crazy, but I don't know, in Portugal we do it with no problem. Um, I'll take the squid and I won't do anything to them, not clean them, not wash them, not skin them, not take the ink out, not the guts, nothing. And hopefully, if I'm really lucky, I'll have squid roe in there, the eggs, which are unbelievable. I had them for the first time maybe three years ago. I couldn't believe how good they were. But those that I get fresh, I come home, I throw salt and pepper on them, a little olive oil and garlic, and throw them on the grill. Cook them 
I don't know, maybe eight minutes on both sides, and that is it. I eat the entire thing, and I love it. Not to say I don't like calamari either when you clean it all out and cut it into the pretty little rings. That is as well too, but I do like the ink and I eat the whole thing inside out. I love it. Okay, so these are warming up nice here. Big chunks of garlic. And now I am going to add this tomato sauce. So if you guys want to try this, real simple, you can do this at home. I'm whipping it up for a quick lunch. Just saute the garlic, put in the vegetable, put in the, um, the canned uh, product, that whatever you have. I have the squid. Little tomato sauce, boom. You have a nice quick lunch, took me about 15 minutes. All right, I'll heat this up and then uh, give us a taste test. I'll give you guys the verdict. Be back in a second when this is finished. All right, guys, I'm back. I got this plated up. Looks gorgeous. We got this real dark, dark brown, almost black sauce made with the tomato sauce and the um, squid ink together. Topped it off with some uh, fresh parsley. And I happen to have some, um, this fried uh, garlic uh, condiment that I bought at an Asian market. So we got that on there. We got the oregano flavor going. Looks great. Smells great. I'm starving. Let's see what we got here. This looks like 15 minutes. Well, it smells good. My mouth's watering like crazy. Let's have a taste. Yeah. That's delicious. Yep, no joke there. The sauce has got something about that squid ink. Sounds weird to some people, but it just has this real nice, like thick, savory um, flavor. Hard to describe, but really nice. If you guys can find some, bye everyone. Speaking of healthy eating, uh, as you heard earlier, this show is brought to you by Health IQ. Health IQ uses science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance for health conscious people like runners, cyclists, strength trainers, vegans, and more. You guys are probably not vegans. There, um, there are vegan fishermen, uh, fisher people, but mo not that many. In fact, um, Dave Kellums, my, my old partner, his sister, um, was very conscious about being cruel to animals, and she used to go fishing, and she would take the, the hooks off her fishing lures. So just like to watch the fish attacking the lures, but didn't want to hurt them. Uh, she might qualify for Health IQ. 56% uh, of Health IQ customers save up to one third on their life insurance. Like saving money on car insurance for being a good driver, Health IQ will save you money on your insurance for living a healthy life. If you run a marathon, you probably qualify. If you're a triathlete, you probably qualify. Uh, qualifying is simple. Head to healthiq.com slash FNFP, Fish Nerds Fishing Podcast, FNFP. Take the quiz and you are on the way. Uh, this is really exciting. Now, I, I have a family and kids and stuff like that. And life insurance is one, It's just like a backup plan. It's just like if something happens to me, my kids and my wife get a whole pile of cash and they can take care of things like burying me and paying the mortgage and doing all the things. Uh, life insurance, if you are younger, buy it younger. It's cheaper. Um, and you can you can save some significant money if you're younger and you're fit and you're working you know, on a healthy lifestyle. Go to healthiq.com uh, and uh, slash FNFP and buy it through them. Uh, if you want to see if you qualify, just do it and, and and let us know how it goes. We're really curious about it. This has been rated 9.6 out of 10 on Trustpilot. Uh, Ryan Hall said, it's perfect because it's made for people like me with a healthy, active lifestyle. The lower heart rates that many pro athletes have can sometimes negatively affect insurance rate. Uh, and Hall likes it because it works the opposite. The other thing, it, it also can tell the difference between um, BMI and muscle. Like you can... Like a lot of weightlifters can't qualify for good health insurance because they're they're heavy, and they have a high BMI according to, you know, getting on a scale. 
but uh, Health IQ can tell the difference. So it, it really, really matters. It's, it's worth doing. To see if you qualify and get a quote today, head to healthiq.com slash FNFP, healthiq.com slash FNFP. Uh, checking in with our sponsors on using our coupon codes like this really does help the podcast. So it's worth your time. It only take you a minute and see if you qualify. All right. And a couple weeks ago, I took I dragged my family. It was like negative ten or twenty degrees outside. I didn't want to go fishing, so I dragged my family to Manchester, New Hampshire, to the Rockingham Fishing and Hunting Expo. This used to be down in Salem, New Hampshire, uh, for I think for four or five years. Uh, the fishing nerds used to have a booth at this event, uh, and then it moved, and we, we it had a new owner, and we kind of disconnected a little bit with it. But we went down, and uh, I kind of walked around, and I asked the fishy people the same question over and over again. I'm going to let the uh, let the piece speak for itself. Hi, I'm Zoe, and um, we are at the Rockingham Fishing and Hunting Expo in Manchester. That's right. What are we going to do today? What are, we, what are you hoping to see today? Fish. Fish things. All right, we're going to look for fish things. All right, and I should say who we are. Sammy is here. Sammy, say hi. Hi. And Kristen is hiding out. So we are all here, and we're going to check out this expo. Let's go. All right, fishnerds.com. We're hanging out here at the Rockingham Fishing Hunting and Expo. we got Betsy with us. Betsy, right? Yeah. Betsy with us and Mark, who we've known for years. Mark we're, we're um, and Betsy, we've been fishing, catching a lot of rainbow trout lately. And I ate one the other day, and it tasted terrible. So the question I'm asking everybody, what's the best way to cook a rainbow trout? Hmm, I go to the Rainbow Grill up in Pittsburgh and have Dave do it. Um, trout almondine. You got to get that thing boned out and finish it with some amaretto. That's the way to do it. I don't have the whole recipe, but Dave does. We can always Google it, right? Absolutely. And I think it might be on our website at fishnh.com, a recipe of him doing that. So trout almondine. And, and you guys, by the way, Fishing Game has been getting viral almost with your cooking recipes. I saw one. Uh, did you make that? It was the white perch? Yes, that's me with the white perch crab, crab uh, fish cakes. Yeah, it was so good. It was on WMUR this morning, and I and all over the internet. Yeah, it was total this morning. You're kidding me! All right, we're going huge. That's featured. They said it's already been seen by almost 200 people. Wow, 200. <laughs> Maybe by the end of the day it'll be 400. Maybe if you're very very lucky. But it looked great. No, it was, it was they said 2,500 by this morning, and I'm sure. Oh. Way more but than that. So um, that's Mark from Fish and Game, New Hampshire Fish and Game. And, uh, hey, thank you for putting fish in the water. Thanks, Clay. You're Thanks welcome. Bye. You're welcome. Love the fish nerds. Everyone loves the fish nerds. Thanks, Betsy. You're welcome. Thank you. Betsy. Betsy's going to, from Fish and Game, is going to give us her recipe for rainbow trout. No, the only rainbow trout I've caught is up in the woods in the wildies of the uh, backpacking. So you just basically fry it in the pan with a little bit of oil or butter. You know, and, and that's it. None of this fancy schmancy, you know, Amandine stuff. Mark is known for his fancy pants lifestyle and you know, his high-end life because he's a, been here so long. I did learn that you have to slice the outside of the skin to keep it from curling up. Good advice. Good tip. Thank you so much. Um, I've never eaten a rainbow trout try I've liked. I'm going to keep trying until I like it. Or, yeah. You're crazy. I don't know. <laughs> I'm here with Captain Mike. Hi, Captain Mike. How's it going? Good. And what is your business? Uh, we do sport fishing charters out of Lake Ontario and Lake Champlain. Uh, NortheasternSportFishing.com. NortheasternSportFishing.com. And I'm asking everyone one question, Captain Mike. Don't be nervous. But uh, I, I find I hate eating rainbow trout. They taste terrible. So I want to know the best way to cook a rainbow trout. I'm going to tell you on the grill with some onions and some butter and a little bit of lemon. Onions, butter, lemon. Any other tricks? No, nope, that would be it, unless you beer batter them. Fry it, it's all good. <laughs> Fry anything. All right, thanks, Captain Mike. And what's your favorite fish to eat? Brown trout. Brown, really, brown trout? Yes, sir. You know, until I was 30, I thought brown trout was a euphemism for poop. I had no idea. <laughs> nope. My, my dad used to say, oh, flush it down with the brown trout. I had no idea it was a real fish, so. <laughs> <laughs> nope, brown trout are excellent. All right, thanks, Captain Mike. Name is Patrick Malfay. Website is KentuckaCanoe.com. And we see you every expo. Every year I see you, like one or two expos, and, and you do a lot of this, right? We do. We, we, we set up throughout New England. 
which is perfect. And you sell these great uh, kayaks. And and you're friends with our friend Ryan du- Dubai, who's uh, Dubai. I get confused. Who's a big, who's part of our show a lot of times. And he always says, "Go talk to Kuntuka River Canoe." So we're happy about that. Question I'm asking uh, everybody is, do you fish first of all? Yes, I do. And do you ever keep any fish? Occasionally, trout. And a lot of people eat trout, and I can't figure it out because I don't think trout tastes good. So the question I'm asking everyone is, if you were to eat a rainbow trout, how would you cook it? Uh, my wife would cook it. <laughs> how would she cook it? Do you know? She'd put it on a grill. Magic. Yeah, magic. <laughs> no, we'd cook it on a grill, aluminum foil on a grill with some seasoning on it. Simple. Yes, yeah, very simple. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not much of a cook, so I let her do all that. That's perfect. And that's KantukaCanoe.com, and you guys are out of New Hampshire. Conquer, New Hampshire. Local. We are local. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. All right. My name's uh, Dan LaPointe, and I own Dan's Fly Shop and Guide Service. And where are you out of? I am out of Gorham, New Hampshire. Oh, and we're in Conway, so we're not that far away. No, we're not. A half hour. We should come visit you sometime. So, Dan, uh, do you ever keep any fish? I do occasionally. We love eating trout, so I do occasionally keep a few. I caught a trout ice fishing the other day. And we cooked it for dinner, and Zoe and I usually love fish. Zoe, what did that trout taste like? Not very good. That was terrible. So, best way to cook a stocked rainbow trout? Best way to cook it is with some uh, vegetable oil and put the trout in a mixture of cornmeal and flour and fry it. So fry the trout. Right. Best way to cook it. The best way to cook it. So, so next one we're going to fry, Zoe, okay? Okay. All right, that's Dan from Dan's Fly Shopping Guide Service in Gordon, New Hampshire. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Willett, officialhooklinesinker.com. And I've known you for, I see your expos every single year, and I'm happy to see you every time. Uh, the question I'm asking everyone is, I've recently had a bad experience cooking rainbow trout. In fact, I've always had a bad experience cooking rainbow trout. I don't like to eat them, but I want to like to eat them. What's the best way to cook a rainbow trout? Well, usually I... I do more catch and release, but what I usually do, put a little uh, thyme, uh, rosemary inside the fish with some lemon and uh, garlic and cook it up that way, and it's, it's unreal. Perfect. And, and I'm, I'm with you. I'm kind of thinking I might be done eating rainbow trout. I might be just releasing it from now on. I don't keep many, but I'm just trying. No, I, I'm not one to take the fish and put it in the freezer. If I'm going to eat it, I'm going to eat it that day. Uh, but normally I do a catch and release, and hopefully I'll catch them again next year. And what's the hot new product from Hook, Line, and Sinker this year? Well, there's a couple. We, we got involved with Taunton, and we have get some um, um, lubricants, Nico environmentally safe baits, and a, a Connect scale. So we, we've expanded our line, and life is good. It's good. I'm really excited about those Nico baits. You showed me those a few minutes ago. In fact, they're biodegradable. For someone like me who loves to fish plastics but hates leaving them behind, I wouldn't feel so bad about it anymore. No, they don't. Uh, they, uh, they're easy to digest for the fish, uh, it, and it doesn't ruin the environment. There's no petroleum products in it. Uh, very green. And what's your website again? Uh, my website is officialhooklinesinker.com. And we'll put links at fishnerds.com. Thank you. I'm hanging out here with Steve Whitman. Hi, Steve. Hi, how are you doing? Good. And you're an uh, outdoorsman. You, you, do you own Long Lake Camps? Yes, I do. It's uh, located in Princeton, Maine. And you're an author. Yes, I, uh, well, an author second. I, I happened to come upon it by uh, coincidence. You know, it's just a, um, a happening, that, something that happened to me about four years ago. And, uh, and I just wrote one book, a true story, and then it just followed into others. And you were talking about this true story. Is it Winning Life's Lottery? Is that the one you were talking about? Yes, that's my first book. It's, uh, it's a true story of uh, my survival in the northern woods of Maine. Uh, unfortunately, I was shot three times by a man and left to die. And it's my survival uh, story on how I made it out. That's incredible. Uh, now, were you shot on purpose? Was he, was he hunting you or was it an accident? Uh, he was hunting me, actually. Uh, and he uh, basically shot me three times with a 45. Uh, I took two to the chest, uh, one to the right hand. And uh, when he thought he was dead, uh, he committed suicide at the scene and left me in the woods. That's terrifying. That's terrifying. I'm going to have to buy this book and read it. And so, Steve, uh, you own Long Lake Camps. And where in Maine is that? Uh, it's in Princeton, Maine. It's uh, up by Callis on the Canadian border. 
And and you are do you guide up there as well as um, have the camps? Yes, I am a registered uh, master main guide, uh, as well as owning the camps. That's incredible. So, winning life's lottery. Your newest book is called Shaker Madison. Is that what I'm seeing there? Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a second book in the series, actually. It's called Shaker Madison, um, Conspiracy to Murder, and it takes place around the Kennedy assassination. So con- connecting the Kennedy with, with Maine and all, all putting together? Is it fiction? It, it's partly fiction, yes, uh, but it also has my theories on what happened uh, uh, during the Kennedy assassination, and believe it or not, after I wrote the book, with some of the uh, papers that are being released uh, by the government, uh, some of the uh, theories I had are actually coming true. So it's a little enlightening, as they say. Do you ever eat fish? Oh, yes. Uh, fish is very good for you. And I, I eat about one rainbow trout a year, and I've never liked it. What's the best way to cook a rainbow trout? Uh, well, any fish uh, like we do up north, uh, we cook a lot of fish on an open fire with a broiler. Uh, salmon, especially, uh, if you butterfly it, take some lemon uh, butter maybe a little bit of garlic in it, and uh, baste it while you're broiling it against an open fire, uh, nothing will beat it. All right, perfect. That's uh, Steve Whitman, author, guide, owner of Long Lake Camps. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, all my books are available on Amazon. And we'll put links up at fishners.com. And we're going to read Winning Life's Lottery, I think. Okay, very good. David Colsar in uh, New Hampshire Rivers Guide Service. And where do you guys focus your guide service? Well, uh, all over New Hampshire and North Central Massachusetts, uh, depending on uh, the time of the year, we go to different locations thinking, uh, you know, where we can get uh, the best fishing or uh, what the clients are looking for. Sometimes we do some warm water trips in the south uh, later in the summer, but uh, mostly trout, a lot of time in the White Mountains, up in the Arrow on the Androscoggin. The Andrew is a great fishery. Everyone talks about it. I live in the White Mountains. So a uh, question for you. I, I, if you were to cook a rainbow trout, how would you cook it? Uh, with a lot of butter, probably. <laughs> Going to mask the flavor of those stocked fish with butter? Exactly. <laughs> All right. And what's your website? Uh, it's uh, uh, nhriversguide.com. Uh, I'm at the New Hampshire Outdoor Learning Center. I want to call it my alma mater because I went to guide school there. And I'm with Steve, the brand new owner. Steve, congratulations. Thank you. How are you enjoying owning this business? I'm having a blast. I went through the classes with Scott. Now I'm the owner of the school, and I can't think of anything better. Yeah. Now I heard you bought it a couple of weeks ago. I bumped into Mark, um, who was associated with the school, Correct. and in, he said, "Oh, yo, Scott left town, went to Alaska." And I went, oh, "Who's running the school now?" And he goes, "Steve." I'm like, "Oh, Steve!" And now I know who you are. Yeah. Yeah. He uh, headed back up to Alaska. I think the boys and he wanted to get back to that great frontier. He's flying bush plane again. And he approached me about the school, and I had just retired from public education, so this was a natural fit. Teacher to teacher, you're there you are. Yep. And how's it been going? Been going very, very well. The classes have been filling up well. The 2018 schedule is already filling up, so we're looking for a good year. I'm going to try and expand where I have, I think, a little bit more time where I'm retired than Scott did. So we're going to try and expand the school and reach some more areas. And, and you moved the school location, too, and you're down in Moanboro? No, we're in Wolfboro. Wolfboro, even yep. better. Yes, yes. We're up in the Lakes region, so we got a lot of clientele up there that have been coming in. And actually, I just talked to some people from Madison today who did classes with Scott, and they're like super psyched that it's right in their backyard now. It's a little easier. Now, I, I also bumped into someone. I was ice fishing the other day, and I bumped into someone who took your class and who will be testing uh, in a uh, few weeks. I was like, his name, his, his bee owns a business called Pops Clamshell. Yes, yes. That's uh, John Benton. He's going to be going for his guide's license coming up in March. Yep, and he went through the December guide school with me. Yeah. And, it, and I took my guide test two years ago. Now, I've, last year, my first full season as a licensed fishing guide, only ice fishing. I can tell people who haven't done it, you will not pass that test without going to guide school. You must do this. So New Hampshire, if you're looking to get your guide license, NH Outdoor Learning Center, nhoutdoorlearning.com is where you want to go. Worth every penny. I mean, it's truly magical. Yep. Uh, I, I did this school, too, before I got my guide's license about five, six years ago, and it was definitely a plus. So one, one question I'm asking everyone at the Expo today is, what is the best way to cook a rainbow trout? I like cooking my trout in a cast iron skillet with butter. Butter makes it great. Yep. That's my favorite way of preparing any trout. Perfect. That's Steve from nhoutdoorlearning.com. Link's available, of course, at fishnerds.com. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, my name is uh, Captain Peter Whalen, and my website is www.shoalsflyfishing.com. 
you fly fishing for um, striped bass. That's correct. Stripers uh, out of the seacoast, out of the Wentworth Marina. Fantastic. I love striper fishing. I've never got one on a fly because I suck at fly fishing, so I might have to give you a call. Now, I'm going to ask you a question about freshwater fish. Do, do you want to do any freshwater fishing? As little as possible. You know, once you get into the big stripers, it's really hard to kind of go backwards, right? Yeah, it is. It is. So have you ever eaten a rainbow trout? Uh, yes, many, many years ago. And, and if, you were, if you, you were forced tomorrow to cook one, I know you're probably a catch and release guy, but if you were forced tomorrow to, ki- to cook one, how would you cook it? I'd cook it in a pan with a little bit of butter and fry it, and then I'd lift the backbone out uh, once I serve it on the plate. So you're fancier than I am. So everyone is, most people are lots of butter, lots of frying going on with the rainbow trout. Thank you so much. And your website, one more time? www.shoalsflyfishing.com. Perfect. Thank you. I don't have a website. But my, name, my name is Ron McKee. I'm Striper Maniac Custom Tackle out of Maine. You make striper stuff. Yes, I do. All right. So I'm going to ask you a question about trout. About trout? <laughs> Good bait fish. <laughs> They're the bait for striper bait, right? Pretty, pretty much. Pretty much. Right, so, so the question I'm asking everyone is, what's the best way to cook a rainbow trout? Frying pan, a little bit of butter, a little bit of salt and pepper, and that's it. Don't even fancy it. That's the best way. I thought you were going to say, put it on a hook, catch a striped bass, and then bread and fry it. <laughs> I've probably seen that done before. <laughs> I bet it'd be a great bait. Probably would be. We have, uh, in New Hampshire, we have some resident stripers living in the Merrimack River, believe it or not, right here in Manchester. And I'm sure they eat their share of trout and salmon. Yep. Well, I know up in Maine, the Mousam River, in the springtime when the stripers come in and the rains are heavy, the trout that are up over the dam in Kennebunk get washed down over and the striped bass feed on them. Why not? Delicious, right? All right. Thanks, Captain Ron. You're welcome. Have a nice one. Right. And we have another sponsor. Can you imagine that? More than one sponsor on a podcast. We really are hitting the big time. This show is also brought to you by Gail's Hot Box Huts. Oh, yeah. Gail's Hot Box Huts is on beautiful Cooks Bay in Lake Simcoe, Ontario. Eh? Uh, this is really cool. They, they contacted me and said, hey, Clay, we don't have a lot of money, but can we give you some money so you can talk about our hot boxes? And I said, how can I not talk about hot boxes? Gail's Hot Box Hut is on, uh, like I said, it's in Ontario on Lake Simcoe, which is known for jumbo perch, pike. Um, they have day huts. They have sleepers. You can go to Facebook, look for Hot Box Huts, the sexiest huts on the ice. Hot Box Huts. Ooh, yeah. Uh, anyway, go to Facebook.com slash Hot Box Huts. Check them out. And if you are in uh, the area of, of Ontario and Sim- Lake Simcoe, you should definitely rent one and go out and check them out. And it kind of made me start thinking about maybe I need to make a bunch of huts and just rent them out here to skip the whole guiding business and just... Just make hot boxes. <laughs> anyway, check out Gail's Hot Box Hot. So we'll share some links on Facebook at fishners.com. So that's it. You've listened to a bunch of fish nerds when you should have been uh, fishing. We'd like to thank our families for supporting us while we podcast, go on fishing quests, and do all the nerdy things that, that fisher people do. Uh, we'd also have to give a special thanks to, of course, all, all of our new sponsors. We're super happy about Hotbox Huts, Health IQ. Use the coupon, uh, use the code slash FNFP, FIQ, FNFP. Uh, and we're glad that Doc Martin is back safe from her trip to the Bahamas. Thanks for those people who called in to the Fish Nerds Hotline. And until next time, follow the code of the Fish Nerd, spawn early and often. Avoid free lunches with strings attached and swim against the current every chance you get.